All right, so the sermon I'm going to preach this morning uh, is actually going to be a little bit more like a Bible study, and I'm going to ask you just to follow along, and it, and it may not be the most exciting or dynamic sermon you've ever heard in your life, but it is important. It's going to teach a few different things, and, and hopefully we can walk away from the sermon having learned something a little bit, and also especially being mindful of reading the Bible carefully when you're reading the Bible, when you're studying, when you're learning on your own. And the story that we started off reading about here is in Exodus chapter 17. I'm going to focus on the first part of the story where basically it's a, it's a you know, if you've read your Bible a few times or whatever, you probably realize, remember how the children of Israel are always complaining, you know, that God's bringing them out of Egypt and he's performing all these miracles and they complain like, oh, no, there's no food here, there's no water here, right? And this happens multiple times. Well, there's an incident that happens, what we read about here, where, you know, the children of Israel are complaining, there's no water here, why did you bring us out of Egypt just to die here in this desert? We can't drink, there's nothing for us to drink here. And God commands Moses, um, Look down in verse number five, the Bible says, And the Lord said unto Moses, Go on before the people and take with thee of the elders of Israel and thy rod, wherewith thou smotest the river, take in thine hand and go. Behold, I will stand before thee there upon the rock in Horeb, and thou shalt smite the rock, and there shall come water out of it that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. So what happens is, is that God commands Moses to go and, and hit the rock with his staff and then water is going to come out. Well, turn if you would now, keep your place here in Exodus 17. We're going to come back to that. So you can put a bookmark there, put your bulletin there, whatever. Go to Numbers chapter 20 because there's another event that happens and if you're just reading casually, there's enough similarities here that would make you think that these are the exact same story. Because for one, you're going to see duplication of stories throughout, you know, as you're reading different books of the Bible, you're going to see uh, the same events brought up oftentimes in different books. So Numbers and Exodus can have duplication in, in the stories that are being told, that are being transmitted. Um, you, you know, there's multiple books that are like that. You know, we have four Gospels that all kind of go over a lot of the same events. So this is not new in Scripture. It's something that you're going to find. And because of that, you may again, casually just kind of assume that these are the same things. And how often are you seeing water come out of rocks when the children of Israel are complaining about it? But actually, what I'm going to prove to you this morning is that the, what happens in Exodus 17 is actually a different event than what happens in Numbers chapter 20. But let's read here in Numbers chapter 20, verse number 1. The Bible reads, Then came the children of Israel, even the whole congregation, into the desert of Zin in the first month, and the people abode in Kadesh. And Miriam died there and was buried there. And there was no water for the congregation, and they gathered themselves together against Moses and against Aaron. And the people chode with Moses and spake, saying, Would God that we had died when our brethren died before the Lord. And why have you brought up the congregation of the Lord into this wilderness, that we and our cattle should die there? And wherefore have you made us to come up out of Egypt to bring us in unto this evil place? It is no place of seed or of figs or of vines or of pomegranates, neither is there any water to drink. And Moses and Aaron went from the presence of the assembly unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, and they fell upon their faces, and the glory of the Lord appeared unto them. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Take thy rod, take the rod, excuse me, and gather you the assembly together, thou and Aaron thy brother, and speak ye unto the rock before their eyes, and it shall give forth his water, and thou shalt bring forth to them water out of the rock. So thou shalt give the congregation and their beasts drink." And definitely up to this point, you're going like, yeah, what's the difference? It sounds exactly the same. They're complaining. They want water. There's no water here. You know, they're getting water out of a rock. But let's keep reading. The Bible says in verse uh, 9, And Moses took the rod from before the Lord as he commanded him. And Moses and Aaron gathered the congregation together before the rock. And he said unto them, Hear now, ye rebels, must we fetch you water out of this rock? And Moses lifted up his hand, and with his rod he smote the rock twice, and the water came out abundantly, and the congregation drank, and their beasts also. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron, Because ye believed me not to sanctify me in the eyes of the children of Israel, therefore ye shall not bring this congregation into the land which I have given them. This is the water of Meribah, 
because the children of Israel strove with the Lord and he was sanctified in them. Now, this was a very serious transgression actually by Moses and Aaron. This one event causes them not to go into the promised land when God is giving it to him, but Joshua ends up leading the children of Israel into the promised land. Jump down to verse number 23. The Bible says, And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in Mount Hor by the coast of the land of Edom, saying, Aaron shall be gathered unto his people, for he shall not enter into the land which I have given unto the children of Israel, because ye rebelled against my word at the water of Meribah. And, and Moses and Aaron are both found to blame here by the Lord, and they both ultimately end up losing their lives because they're not allowed to go into the promised land. Now I'm going to get into a lot of the meaning behind that later. But first, I want to start off by proving that these are two different events. I mean, first and foremost, it, it should stand out to you, go, wait a minute. In Exodus 17, God tells them, thou shalt smite the rock, right? And water is going to come out. Why then is there a problem when Moses goes and smites the rock twice, you know, and, and then water comes out? Is it because, you know, he smote it twice or whatever? But um, actually what you see when you read carefully in Numbers 20, verse 8, the Bible says, Take the rod and gather thou the assembly together, thou and Aaron thy brother, and speak ye unto the rock before their eyes, and it shall give forth his water. So he tells them to speak to the rock to bring forth the water, whereas the other one, he, tells them to, he does tell them to smite with the rod. So people will, will use these types of events also to try to shake your faith and see, oh, there's a contradiction in the Bible. Why is God telling them to smite the rock for water to come out here, but then he's telling them over here, well, now you can't enter in the promised land because you smote the rock, right? It's, it, it, people will try to throw that, or it might just be confusing. But see, that's why it's important to read every word carefully. But I'm going to prove to you there's even more information here to just understand the whole timeline of events. Turn, if you would, to Numbers chapter 33. Numbers 33. Just the seeming contradiction alone should be enough to tell you something's not right there and, and these may not be talking about the same thing. But I mean, another reason why you might think they're the same is because in Numbers 20, it says, you know, it's called the waters of Meribah. And then in Exodus 17, he, it says he called the name of the place Massa and Meribah, right? So they're kind of calling it the same thing. But they, in both places, it gives you the meaning of the words. And I think the reason why it says Massa and Meribah is because it's happened twice. And um, one is because the, children of, uh, the chiding of the children of Israel because they tempted the Lord. That was in Exodus 17. And in Numbers 20, it was because of the children of Israel strove with the Lord and he was sanctified in them. So the meanings are slightly different, even though it was almost the same event that happened. Now, this isn't even in my notes, but I'm just thinking like, the fact that there's two events happening, it, it, it goes to show how short-sighted people can be. And again, the, the, the symbolism here with these people, these are the children of Israel, we're supposed to be the children of God, right? Now we know not, not all of them are saved and, and whatever, like not 100% of all of them, but symbolically they're representing the children of God. And what we see them doing is having a short-sightedness of being so focused on the earthly things that even when God has already performed miracles for them in the past, in the same exact situation, how easily they can forget what God has done for them. I mean, they get to a point where they're going, hey, we don't have any water, which is in Exodus 17. This is the first event that happens. So God miraculously supplies water for them out of the rock. Well, further on down the road, they get to the point again where they're going, hey, there's no water here. Why are you bringing, you know, and then they start complaining again. God's already miraculously taken care of them. God's fed them with manna. God's taken care of them every step of the way. And they still are finding room to complain about their situation and what's going on and having such short-sightedness than to just trust that God will take care of them. And we need to take this to heart because human nature, sinful human nature, hasn't changed. And, and take, instead of taking the attitude of going, oh yeah, those children of Israel, they were so stiff necked real, start applying that to you as a child of God and see, where am I 
Where am I not putting all my trust and faith in the Lord when he's already done this, 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 this for me in my past, in my life, where there's times when I thought there was no way out and I thought that I was, you know, how am I ever going to get out of this? And then God sees you through and then you find yourself in a similar or the same situation again and now you're still lacking the faith that God's going to take care of you. You know, when you get like that, you're acting just like the children of Israel did here. But see, God always comes through. And God will come through, and we need not to. If you could look at that and be like, oh, man, I can't believe they would do that. Don't allow yourself to be like that. Right? I mean, you see, you see that. And we can all see that's not the right attitude to have. They shouldn't be out there murmuring, complaining. Oh, man, you know, why are you bringing us out here? Well, where are you in your life? You got the murmuring, you got some complaining on, on things that may not be going quite right or the way that you expected them or or how, why would you lead me here, God? It just seems like there's nothing. It's dead. It's barren. But look at Numbers 33. And, and this is another point I want to make because as you do, those of you who read your Bible every day, those of you who do regular Bible reading, let's face it, some chapters are more interesting and engaging than others in the Scripture. Nonetheless, Every word of God is pure and true, and, and, and all of the chapters, all of the verses are important for one reason or another. Okay, otherwise, it, there would be no point of it being in God's word. Numbers 33 may seem like a really boring chapter when you're just reading it at home, but don't skip over these chapters. Don't skip over the genealogies. Don't skip over the, the, the chapters that seem to be boring. Pray that God will open up some more understanding so you can understand why is this in the Bible. Because when you start to really study, these chapters come in very handy and very useful to get a, a full understanding of other parts of the Bible. And in this one example that I'm going through here, yeah, there's a lot of other clues. So this is actually easier to deduce and to figure out and to search for. But we're going to see in Numbers 33 how it is very clearly tying everything together, how you can see, oh, yeah, this event happened first and here's where they went. And then they, they continued on and then that event happened. So that there's no doubt in your mind that even though they call it the waters of Massa, the water of Meribah, that they're two separate events that happened. Look at uh, verse number one in Numbers 33. The Bible says, These are the journeys of the children of Israel, which went forth out of the land of Egypt with their armies under the hand of Moses and Aaron. And Moses wrote their goings out according to their journeys by the commandment of the Lord. And these are their journeys according to their goings out. And then as you read through, it's going to tell you they went here and they went here. And you're thinking like, you know, don't, don't just let your eyes gloss over and just go, oh, whatever, who cares that they, you know what, God cares because Moses recorded their goings out at the commandment of God. So, you know, if nothing else, remember that and think about that when you're doing your reading. And it may be more of a chore, it may be harder for you to keep focus and keep attention because it's not as exciting but I'm telling you, it's going to be useful and valuable for you to really st stay intent on the reading and ingest and digest as much as you can from that. And, and, and always give your best to the reading and, and try and understand as much as you can. Because I'll tell you what, you, you may not understand it the first time or second time or third time or fourth time or fifth time or sixth time or seventh time going through the Bible. But the repetition is going to help it stay in your memory. And this is a truth. I actually preached on this same exact topic six years ago. And, and I love, this is something that for me it was, this was a truth that I had studied and learned without hearing it preached somewhere else. So it was kind of pivotal, pivotal for me. Um, but it's great to have those moments where you get this understanding and it's all through the study. And at that point, you know, I've, I had already read the Bible many times and never knew it. And I kind of, and the reason why I'm saying, you know, it's easy to just kind of think that these might just be the same event because 
for me, that's exactly what I thought when I was reading until I actually started looking more carefully and closely and going, wait a minute, this doesn't make any sense. And then you study it out further and then, and then you can get it. So uh, obviously, I have my own backstory for this, but I'm trying to relay that to you. So I've prepared this to help you out in, uh, in your own learning and study of the Bible. Now, in Numbers 33 is where we are. Jump down to verse number 14, because it gives you this whole list, but the, the pertinent areas are going to focus on what it relates to this particular passage in this story. Verse 14 says, And they removed from Elish and encamped at Rephidim, where was no water for the people to drink. And they departed from Rephidim and pitched in the wilderness of Sinai. Now, this matches, if you still have a bookmark in Exodus 17, and we're going to be looking at Numbers 20 and Exodus 17, because those are the two stories, with Numbers 33. Exodus 17, verse 1 says, And all the congregation of the children of Israel journeyed from the wilderness of sin after the journeys according to the commandment of the Lord and pitched in Rephidim, and there was no water for the people to drink. So that location of Rephidim happens in Numbers 33 and verse number 14 and 15, and both of them are, are making mention that, hey, there was no water there. The other event that we saw in Numbers 20 happens later. If you jump down to verse 36 in Numbers 33, after more of their traveling around and their journeys that are recorded in Numbers 33, verse 36 says, And they removed from Ezion Geber and pitched in the wilderness of Zin, which is Kadesh, and they removed from Kadesh and pitched in Mount Hor in the edge of the land of Edom. And Aaron the priest went up into Mount Hor at the commandment of the Lord and died there in the 40th year after the children of Israel were come out of the land of Egypt in the first day of the fifth month. And this is the event that matches Numbers 20. Numbers 20 verse number one says, Then came the children of Israel, even the whole congregation, into the desert of Zin in the first month. And... You could, and I didn't even have this uh, in here, but you could see the wilderness of Zin, the desert of Zin, and then it says, and the people abode in Kadesh, and Miriam died there and was buried there. So, um, verse 37, number 33 says, they removed from Kadesh and pitched in Mount Hor in the edge of the land of Edom. And we can see even how long they spent there because it says that Aaron died in Mount Hor in the fifth month. And in Numbers 20, it says uh, that they came in the first month into the desert of Zin. So you could see how long it took them in that area. Now, I don't have the, the, the extra learning of what, why, you know, the importance of that. I just, this kind of popped out at me right now. You can see how long they've even been there for. But jump down to verse number 13 in Numbers 20. So that's showing, because this Numbers 20 goes over this whole story which mentions the desert of Zin. It mentions that they abode in Kadesh. And then in verse 13, it says, this is the water of Meribah, because the children of Israel strove with the Lord and he was sanctifying them. And then verse 14 says, and Moses sent messengers from Kadesh unto the king of Edom. And in Numbers 33, 37, it says that they were in the, on the edge of the land of Edom. So again, you just have all these clues that's tying it together, showing, okay, well, he's sending messengers to the king of Edom. Why? Because they're on the edge of the, 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 the land of Edom. And they came out of the wilderness of Zin in both situations, and they're staying in Kadesh. So it's, it's very easy to see, okay, yes, this is obviously talking about the same situation. Number 33 brings up there in Mount Hor. We know that's where Aaron dies, and it's a result of what happened in Numbers 20. Um, and then in Numbers 20, verse 23, the Bible says, And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in Mount Hor by the coast of the land of Edom, saying, Aaron shall be gathered unto his people, for he shall not enter into the land which I have given unto the children of Israel, because ye rebelled against my word at the water of Meribah. So we can clearly see the difference, right, when you, when you start piecing them together. And, you know, hopefully I did a good enough job at, at trying to, to, to tie everything together there. Um, it's something that you kind of need to, to focus on and maybe make notes on and write down it when you're doing this on your own, right? I, I encourage you, like, so, you know, when I, when I look at and study this stuff, I usually have to write down or copy and paste or whatever, right? If, you, if you've got a digital, like eSword or something like that, I could kind of put these verses side by side and say, okay, how do these, oh, look at that, look at that. Either way, however you do it, it, it requires a little bit of your own digging. But, you know, I encourage you to do that. Everyone should be reading regularly, but hopefully 
things will stand out to you or you'll have questions about things or you'll see things that maybe don't make sense or it might seem like a contradiction, look into that a little bit more. You know, I'm going to do my best to show you the things that I've learned and what I've seen to help teach you and guide you, but do that for yourself. Do your own learning, your own studying. See, that's where the Bible study comes in is when you start writing things down and comparing and you're taking scripture against scripture. But see, you're not able to do that and don't do that until you've already read through the Bible cover to cover at least a few times. Because you need to understand the context and what are the stories even talking about and get some of the foundation just by going through start to finish, start to finish, start, okay, I've read, I feel like I, you know, I've read through, I know where certain stories are, I know what, generally speaking, what these books are about, you know, just on a real high level. You have to have that understanding first before you really can start digging in because you, you just need to have that back knowledge in order to make sure your study is correct. Now, now we're going to focus a little bit on, if, if, hopefully you're in Numbers chapter 20. We see the difference. We can see there's two different events clearly. Okay. But why did God get so angry and, and, and punish Moses and Aaron so much? I mean, Moses had done all this great work, right? I mean, leading the children of Israel out. He had to deal with their murmuring, their complaining. You know, he had this faith in God. He was doing these great miracles and, and all of this stuff. He'd already smitten the rock once before for the water to come out. So what's the big deal that he went and smote the rock twice and, you know, the water still comes out and they're taken care of? Why is it that big of a deal that he can't even enter into the promised land? Well, we're going to look a little bit closer into what he did in Numbers 20. Look at verse number 10. The Bible says, And Moses and Aaron gathered the congregation together before the rock and said unto them, This is important. Here's what they said. Hear now, ye rebels, must we fetch you water out of this rock? And Moses lifted up his hand, and with his rod he smote the rock twice, and the water came out abundantly, and the congregation drank, and their beasts also. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron, Because ye believed me not to sanctify me in the eyes of the children of Israel, therefore ye shall not bring this congregation into the land which I have given them." They had used their staff in the past, but this time God said to speak to the rock. I already pointed that out. We already saw that. But they're also putting themselves as the ones getting the water instead of giving the glory unto the Lord. So, well, oh, do we have to, oh, oh, you rebels, do we have to just go and get you water out of this rock? Wait a minute, God said to speak unto the rock. And in the past, you know, Moses has done a very good job of, of doing exactly as God had commanded. And there's a lot of things in the book of Exodus that are very, very, very specific. I mean, talk about the building of the tabernacle and some hard reading, because that's very specific. I mean, you talk about the fillets and the chapters and the pomegranates and the, you know, and, and the hangings and, and everything, okay? The colors, the lengths, the width, the dimension, you know, it's all spelled out. God's very particular. And when he says to do something, and when he says to do something a certain way, then that, that's how you do it. And there's some things that are accepted of God, and there's some things that aren't. And while, yes, God knows the heart, which is important, he also is particular in what he says to do. And you know what? He wants you just to do what he says. So if he tells you this is the way that the tabernacle is going to be built, then you know what? That's the way it ought to be built. You don't need to add your own flair or do anything different or say, oh, I think this would look better. Look, just do what God said. And in this instance, God said, hey, speak unto the rock. Now, think about this too. Moses has been using that staff quite a bit for the miracles. I mean, he used that with the parting of the waters. He used that with the rod becoming a serpent. He used that many times turning the water. But there's so many times where the staff was being used and even previously with the rock, God had told him to use the staff to, to smite the rock with it. So God had, had told them, because ye believed me not. And we, don't, we can't get into the minds of Moses and Aaron, but we can see through their actions what they had done. And you can see where it could be easy to think, 
more on the staff or the rod having the power than just, well, it's because God said so, he's the one doing it. Right. I mean, just getting to the point of saying, well, hey, do we have to just go and do this for you now? Hold on a second, Moses. You know, like, you're, you're not bringing the water out of the rock, really. Like, I mean, you're doing what God said to do, and you should be speaking what God said to speak, and God's going to be the one providing, and God, it's, it's the water that God is giving to the people to sustain them, not you. Now you're leading, and it's an important job, and, and you need, you know, God's going to work together with people, but don't get, you know, too ahead of yourself into thinking that, oh, we are doing this, right? So they didn't sanctify the Lord as much as themselves in the eyes of the children of Israel because they're the ones saying, hey, we have to do this. Now, the other thing is that this is immensely significant in the symbolism. And a lot of what happens in the Old Testament and the particularity that God has in the Old Testament, the reason why it's so important is because it's teaching other things. There's a much greater teaching going on. You say, well, why does God care so much? Why is he so particular about, you know, the, the way that the tabernacle is set up? Why? Because there's more to learn about that. If there wasn't, it wouldn't, he wouldn't care to have that part of Scripture. But it is important. And he, you know, with, with all of these things, with everything that's in the Scripture, it, it's all important. There's more things to learn. The sacrifices all had a particularity in, the, in how they were to be made. And especially you know, the, the, the Passover lamb. Right? Very particular. I mean, it's got to be, it's gotta be burnt with fire, roast with fire. You can't have it sodden with water. You can't eat it raw. You know, like he, he makes all these points saying, look, and why does he do that? Because it's all symbolic. It's all teaching other truths. Those sacrifices are representing Jesus Christ in various ways, depending on his particularity for each one. I mean, even the scapegoat, right? That's going to take away the sins of the people. And you're going to let it go. That's what Jesus Christ represents. You know, the scapegoat represents Jesus Christ of taking the sins of the people away. I mean, there's, there's so many things. The thing is, when you don't do it right, when you don't do it the way that God said, now you're screwing up the teaching. You're screwing up the picture that God has given and what he's trying to teach. God commanding Moses and Aaron to speak unto the rock to bring forth that water is very significant. And we're going to see some in the New Testament. You can turn, if you would, to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and then we're going to go to the book of John. And you probably already know where we're going with this because it's, it's, such a, it's a pretty basic fundamental truth, but it's very important. And especially us as New Testament believers, you know, we see the significance a lot easier because we have the New Testament writings that has shed more light on the things of the past. So in Moses and Aaron's day, they may not have been thinking so much about what God's trying to teach besides just getting the water for the people. But God knows what he's trying to do and what he's trying to teach with the people there. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1, the Bible reads, Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. And before we continue any further, it's obviously talking about the children of Israel being brought forth out of Egypt. And it's applying another spiritual truth to the event that happened of them going through the Red Sea. See, God is multifaceted. There's a lot of things that you could learn from these events. It's not just one thing. God's miracle of bringing them through the Red Sea, it's not even just to show how mighty God is. Now, that's one of the reasons. That's one of the things he's showing. He's showing it doesn't matter if you've got a whole sea in front of you and it seems physically impossible. God's able to make a way through the impossibility because God is almighty and God can do all things. That's, of course, one of the things, but that's not the only thing. We see here that it's saying, you know, they were baptized because they were surrounded by all that water as they're going through. And it's a symbolic reference after their salvation coming out of Egypt of being baptized and then going into the promised land. So there's, there's other things to learn. We see that going on here. Verse 2, look at verse number 3. And did all eat the same spiritual meat, talking about the manna, and did all drink 
the same spiritual drink for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was Christ. So when we see the water coming out of the rock, that rock is representing Jesus Christ and they need to speak unto that rock in order to bring forth that water of life unto them. And you don't use a rod, you don't use a staff, you don't need to hit it. He wanted to teach that truth in this illustration of speaking under the rock to bring forth that water. John chapter 7, verse 37. Turn if you go to John chapter 4. John 7, 37 says, In the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive, for the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. And then in John chapter 4, verse number 6, the Bible reads, Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. For his disciples were gone away into the city to buy meat. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, look at this, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. Who's that spiritual rock? Christ. And what's he saying to the woman at the well? Hey, if you knew who I was, if you knew that I was this spiritual rock, you would have asked me and I would have given you living waters. That is the truth being represented in the Old Testament. It was a picture of salvation. It was a picture of uh, Christ is the rock. He's our foundation. He's solid, right? And you go to that rock when you, you are in need, look, they're in a wilderness. They're going to die. They're in a, in a desert place. They have no water. They're ready to perish. They have nothing to look forward to but just doom and, and, and perishing. But you know what? There's a rock there. And if they call on that rock, that rock will provide them the life that they need. It provides them that sustenance. It's going to give them that life. It's going to give them those living waters. Now, obviously, that was a physical representation, but the whole point was the spiritual teaching behind it which was extremely important. So yeah, God was pretty upset when they screwed up his, you know, what he told them to do. The will of the Lord was that they spake unto the rock and the water would come out. They disobeyed the will of the Lord. And look, because we have free will, now God still could know that they were going to do that, but they chose to do what they did. God has given us the ability to not have to do what he says to do. And it doesn't take away from the all-powerfulness of the Lord. It has to do with, with the way that he made us and the way that the world works, the way that he made the world to work. It's giving us the ability to choose. And I don't want to get into the whole Calvinism thing and, you know, and free will, but I mean, it's just one more example of that. Now, he's still able to get his point across, but see, here's how he did it now. Is that now he's saying, okay, Moses and Aaron, you're not allowed to get into the promised land. Because the picture, the representation is, you're calling on the rock, he's giving you, you know, if they would have just listened to that and done that, they would have been, they would have been leading the children of Israel all the way into the promised land. But now they can't. Because what they had done was they took the staff and smote the rock, which now is be, being representative of their own works, of them. Must we do this for you? I'm sorry, Moses, you're not the one that's bringing salvation to the people. The rock is. You just call on that rock, and that'll bring the salvation. So yeah, they couldn't enter into the physical promised land because you know what? That was representative of the spiritual promised land. A lot you could learn in a good study of the scripture. It's a shorter sermon. It doesn't take much, but I, I, I hopefully this will, will stay you know, with you because reading the Bible is important. You know, y'all ought to be reading every single day. 
It may not be exciting. The first pass, or second, or third, or fourth, or fifth, or sixth, or seventh, or tenth. But you know what? Maybe on the 20th it will be. For me personally, this is really exciting. This is a great discovery for, for me personally. Like it's, just, it's just fun. Like I, hopefully you find that stuff for yourself because it is joyful and exciting and being like, you're, you know, when you see and feel your eyes being opened up and going, wow, I never saw that before. That's really cool. That's exciting. I want you to have that in your spiritual life. Y'all can have it. It's the same Holy Ghost teacher that teaches all of us. There is nothing special about me or anyone else for that matter when it comes to just being able to receive knowledge from God. You just need to have the dedication to the Word and just study it. Right? And there's so much more to learn. And that's, that's the other exciting part is that you'll never run out of great truths like that in your lifetime, ever. I think in eternity, we're never going to run out of just the, the greatness and the depth, the, the eternal depth of the Lord in, in the wisdom and knowledge and stuff. I mean, there, there's, don't let Bible reading become a drudgery. That's the bottom line. Don't let it become a drudgery. If you don't understand something, keep working through it, okay? You don't have to stop everything to just figure out something you don't understand. You can keep going. But, Take the time sometimes to do more than just a little bit of reading and cursory study and, and, do, and dig in a little bit and start trying to find. Once you understand, oh yeah, I know, I know that these books talk about this, then focus on those books. And it might take you more than a day to do it. Keep notes. Keep looking into that stuff. So you know, hopefully it's a blessing to you. I, I'd love, you know, I, I haven't re-preached very many sermons at all just because for me, I like having new things or different things to talk about. But this one was one that, that was all right. It's still exciting for me. And I went back and I, I picked up a couple other little things anyways by going back and revisiting this even for myself. So um, bottom line is, is read your Bible, study it carefully, right? And don't just make assumptions. Make sure you're reading every word and, uh, and let God show these great truths unto you. All right, as far as I have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your word and for just the, the perfection in your word and um, how many great truths there are for us to learn. Help us to be able to see those truths, Lord. And, and we know that you promised that you'll give wisdom and knowledge liberally unto those that, that ask. And um, Lord, we're asking that you would teach us and guide us and help us understand more great truths from the scripture. We thank you for preserving your words for us, that we have, we have a word that we can completely trust in today without doubt, without any doubts of errors or, or omissions or problems, dear Lord, or contradictions, that if we would just study your words, we would be able to see how perfect they truly are. And I pray that you would please open up our eyes, help us to learn and grow. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.